Hello, welcome to an episode of Bibliophiles, the show on AADL TV, where we take a few moments each episode to discuss a variety of books on one particular topic. And we each pick a different selection and we don't tell each other ahead of time what we are choosing. So it's kind of an extra little fun bit for us. Um, my name is Amanda and I'm joined as always by Christopher and Lucy. And we are excited to have special guest Beth on board with us this episode. So thanks for joining us, Beth. Um, so this week, we or this episode, we are discussing or we are revisiting books we read when we were younger. How was it on another read? I'm excited to see what everybody chose to talk about today. So why don't we start off with Lucy? Lucy, what did you bring for us? Uh, so the book that I chose to read was Julie of the Wolves, which was one of my favorite, favorite books when I was younger. Um, it won the Newbery in 1973. It was actually written the year I was born, um, which, I mean, I never put that together at the time I was reading it. But um, it was a really interesting and great reread. I have to say, I totally noticed different things. So this is the story of a girl named um, Miax and Julie, Julie. So one's like her Inuit name and one is her assimilated name. And she lives in a Eskimo village in Alaska. And... Um, when we meet her, she has gone away from that village on her own. We don't know why right in the beginning, but she's basically like barely surviving. And she realizes she's going to have to find a way to get food. And so she watches this wolf pack really closely, tries to figure out all of their code and sign language and what they do to get food. And she learns really like their code and she uses her hands as ears and she sees how they nip each other's nose and and so there's like a lot of detail about the hierarchy within a wolf pack and the alpha wolf. And um, she sort of becomes like part of this wolf pack. I mean, she doesn't like speak wolf and she doesn't run around with them. She lives on the edge, but she really um, gets to know them. And then you realize she ran away because she was taken away from her home with her father in this seal camp, the seal hunting camp to be sent to a essentially a boarding school, a Christian boarding school where she was supposed to be assimilated. And like, that's one of the things that when I read it when I was younger, I don't think I picked up on that. I wouldn't have known there hadn't been so much of a conversation about it. Um, and then she ended up getting married to uh, 13. She was 13. She got married to a 13 year old who had some, um, mental delays and he ends up sort of, attacking her so she runs away and she's gonna go to san francisco because she's a pen pal so she sets out on the tundra and her father has taught her all this stuff about how to stay alive and how to hunt and she has all her furs and she has some matches and she really knows what she needs to do and so there's this huge part of this book which i think is one of the reasons i loved it when i was younger that's like a survivalist book which is one of my favorite things to read and then it kind of goes on from there. So you have the first part, you have the wolves. The second part, you get her story. And then the third part is what happens when the wolves move on and she realizes she has to like start, keep going on her way forward. And she starts to think a lot about the way that like, you know, um, industrialization and human beings have basically encroached on land and how that's changed animal patterns and what that means for wolves and hunting. And she's torn between what she calls these old Eskimo ways and this new life. And so the last section is really about what she's going to decide to do. And um, there's so much in this book, like the whole assimilation piece. There's a lot about like how the climate and people are already changing the land. This was in 1973 and um, the difference like between how different groups and cultures treat animals and there's a whole bit about um, drinking and alcoholism. There's parents that um, are, you know, really struggling with that. And so it was interesting to pick all of that up in this book that was written in 1972. The woman who wrote it, Jean um, Craighead George, is not Native. She's a, a white person, but she did live in Alaska for a long time. She worked at the Arctic Research Center, learning all about wolf code. And she's a naturalist by trade. And so she knew all those details are really, really um, finely honed. I think there was some cultural criticism about like, maybe she blended two different, you know, Inuit languages, um, and she didn't get all the customs right. But she did have someone, an Inuit woman named Julia, 
guiding her on that journey. So I loved rereading it. Um, I definitely am looking at it with a more critical eye, both as an adult and 50 years later, but um, it was still a really good story. It's well-written and it's got a lot of elements for a lot of different readers. So that was a kind of lengthy description of Julie of the Wolves by Jean uh, Craighead George, written in 1972. Um, Beth, what did you pick? Well, thank you for sharing that. I I don't think I read Julie and the Wolves. I'm pretty sure my kids did. And yeah, but I, I just don't remember that one. But I, I do want to read it. Well, I chose Sounder, which is a book that I read. I, I'm looking at this. Well, okay. So it was written in 1970. It was a, a um, uh, Newbery Award winner. Um, and then there was a film made in 1972. So it's super, super sad. It's uh, about this uh, um, sharecropper's family. Uh, they're so they're very poor, and they don't, you know, they they have to fend for themselves by their or hunt for food, et cetera. And they have this dog named Sounder. But right at the beginning, um, something bad happens to Sounder and and the dad. Uh, he gets taken away. Have you and um, the, to jail they don't really uh aren't really sure where he is and they've managed to locate him uh the and it's all through the eyes of the older son um and so it's kind of his story and how he's trying to manage the family in the absence of his father and also uh keep his father uh in in their minds and eyes and trying to find him and um uh, and then there's also the loss of Sounder or the looking for him. And then he, he does, I don't want to get too much into it, but it's, it's just super sad. I mean, the whole time I read it this time, I was thinking, wow, why were you reading such a sad book, girl? But I also noticed it says for ages 12 and up, and I was probably nine or 10. Um, I don't know if that matters, but, but, um, I do, I just remember, uh, reading it seeing the film and and it's and i just don't remember it being as is so dark um it's just but but in the end i guess i it, it's it gets settled because there's no suffering maybe is is one way to look at it and another thing um by the way this is by william h armstrong um i realized that the the in the cover that the next book by this author, Sour Land, is the boy of Sounder, now grown to manhood, shares his love and knowledge of all living things with a white farmer and his motherless children. So, and then in the face of cruelty and injustice, he teaches dignity, hope, instead of despair. I'm curious about Sour Land, and I th think I'd like to read that too. Did anyone else read that book? Okay. I read Sounder. I don't remember when. I took a lot of children's lit classes when I was in college, and I may I know I read Julie of the Wolves in when I was at college, and I may have read Sounder at that point, or maybe it was in one of the schools I was substitute teaching in mm -hmm. part of it. Um, yeah, good pick so far. Thank you. All right, uh, we've got Christopher to share. Thank you, Beth. If you were trying to put me off from reading that by saying that it was dark and so full of sadness, you didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just... I, I mean it's it's beautifully written, and I I felt like I could really you know feel the presence of the way the descriptions were of the land and everything. So, but yeah. good. I hope you do read it. Just get yeah. your shoes out. Sure. <laughs> and Lucy, uh, your book I that I haven't read sounded so 1970s to me there was yeah. something about it it just uh really sounded like books of that era it, yeah very much is well i read a book uh that came out a long time ago and i uh just reread it i it's a trilogy it's the lord of the rings big shocker but i haven't read these books since about 1978 so it's been a long long time so uh 
I didn't remember much from the books. As I said, it's a long time ago, but I have even more respect for all the world building that Tolkien did. He created a whole history, a whole geography, language systems, a whole mythology and creation stories, and on and on and on. It's, of course, really an epic struggle between good and this kind of cataclysmic evil that's taking over the world. Um, we really can't discuss the books these days without thinking about the movies. And I know the movies better. And I was really surprised both at how many direct quotes came right out of the books and were put into the movies. And also how Peter Jackson really improved some of the scenes in the books. Bad things happen from time to time and they go so fast. You almost miss the real impact of something horrible happening. And that was really surprising to me upon rereading these books. Um, of course, you know, looking back now, uh, we can definitely say there are almost no female characters in all of these books. It's really striking now. There's one that kind of shows up late in the third book, but that's about it. And she, you know, she's a heroic figure, but she's also kind of a love interest too, which is kind of a throwaway uh, as far as a role for a female character, I think. Um, the last book is perhaps a little bit of a slog. In some ways, it feels okay that it is. Um because we're kind of wrapping things up and just the the plot i think reflects that it's probably okay the other thing i wanted to say about these books is they really pioneered epic fantasy there was no one before tolkien doing this kind of a thing and i wonder if his peers really thought he was kind of nutty making up this whole world and these languages and talking about elves and now, you know, it's it's much more common. My last comment about these books are that the the very end, the the last sections in the books are not well reflected in the movies. So if you haven't read the books, you'll be I'd say they're even grimmer in the books, because after all the war, all of this turmoil and everyone's lives turned upside down and death. You finally get back home and things are not as you remembered them. And there's a whole saga left to, to take place there. And then after all that, you feel so uh, really kind of polluted and corrupted from your whole saga that you have to go away and kind of live in this weird hobbit retirement community. Um, so I love the message there that there's really no winning. And that's Lord of the Rings that I just reread. <laughs> Amanda, what did you reread? Well, I'm glad you picked those books to share with us today. That's awesome. Um, I read the second and third ones of the trilogy, and I did read The Hobbit. But I read books two and three after I saw the first movie, so I kind of skipped. Because I hated The Hobbit when I read that in the children's lit class. I reread The Hobbit and loved it, so... You never can tell. Um, so for today, I did a bit of a cheat and I picked um, The Outsiders because I selfishly wanted to read it again. So this is The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. It was published in 1967 and the author was 16 when she wrote it. So it has high appeal for teens. And this book is still taught in eighth grade at a lot of schools, which is awesome. And that's when I read it for the first time. It was published in 67. The movie came out in 83 and it's a very well-known and loved adaptation and if the movie came out in 83 i would have seen it at least 20 times before i read the book for the first time and i read it in my eighth grade english class and i loved the book and since i had such an attachment to those characters in the story already it didn't none of that was diluted it kind of and of course i saw those actors faces when i was reading it um and so i was curious and i don't remember if i've read it since i was that young, even though I've seen the movie even more times. So I wanted to read it. And I actually went ahead and listened to it. And I was kind of afraid to listen to it because 
Um, in the book, there's a character named Pony Boy Curtis. He's a 14 year old boy and he's the narrator of this. He narrates the voiceover in the movie. And I was kind of nervous to listen to it. And I liked the audio. Um, Pony Boy did a good, the, the voice actors did a good job. Um, so if you're not familiar with The Outsiders, um, it takes place in Oklahoma. There is a 14 year old boy named Pony Boy Curtis and he has two older brothers, Soda Pop and Daryl. And their parents died less than a year ago and they're all living together in the same house. And the two older brothers are not in school. So they're working to try to make money to live. And there's Pony Boy, the youngest brother, and he's kind of dreamy. He likes poetry and books and sunsets and that kind of thing, which sets him apart from some of his other friends. Um, he and his brothers are part of a group they call the Greasers, which are like, um, I don't want to say from a rough and tumble neighborhood, but they're definitely in um, a lower income bracket than some of the other kids in town known as the Socias. They are the rich kids with all the breaks, as some of them say. So you kind of have this culture clash going on. You have a lot of these really amazing young, good young characters who are unique and original. And so the socials are constantly battling heads with the greasers. And it's kind of cool because with um with your your eyes are more on the the, the greasers, the pony boy and his brothers. Those are the, the three focus, the main characters. Um but it's really cool to read and see how this found family of these young well, these young boys taking care of each other because they're all kind of from broken homes with like abuse and negligence going on. So it was nice to see that that family um, group. But it's basically a coming of age tale. Um, the Greasers versus Associates. There's different like um, they have a rumble in here. Um, something really bad goes down and Pony Boy's involved in that. And he's got to kind of figure out how to get out of that. There's the constant threat of Pony Boy being sent to a boy's home, they call it, because he, him and his older brother, Soda Pop, I think he's 16, they're underage. And if they find out they're from like a bad household where bad things are happening and they're wrapped up in like, you know, police stuff, like there's a chance they'll get taken away. So it's, it's a really cool and engrossing book. And I can see why young people like it because even though it was written in 1967, like the young people I know that have read it recently in the past couple of years, they still really love it because you've got these engrossing characters in this gripping story that gets dark and gritty. And like there are some of the characters die. Um, it's just a really cool like action in a drama. And it was cool to revisit. Um, so it's, for me, it's a bit of a cheat because I, I watched the movie. So I don't know why I was allowed to watch this movie so many times, like when I was very small in the eighties, but my brother and I just watched it. We loved it. We quoted it. Um, and by listening to it on audio this time around, since I know the movie basically by heart, it was interesting to see there are a lot of the same lines or some of the same dialogue where I could like predict what was going to be said out loud next, but it was just a little bit different. Um, so it was kind of fun. I, I don't regret listening to it on audio and I'm really glad that I, I got to read it again. So yeah, and I can't wait to tell my nieces that I read The Outsiders again because <laughs> they're the ones who just read it recently. So I think that's kind of fun. Um, so yeah, that is The Outsiders by S. E. Hinton. Any other final thoughts on these books we discussed today or any other ones we read when we were younger? I'm so glad you picked The Outsiders. That's one of my favorite books. And also, like you, I mean, I have seen that movie so many times, <laughs> countless times, um, and would like quote lines from it. So I kind of have them mixed up in my head, the book and the movie, but not in a, in a bad way. Um, so I'm really glad that you picked that. And yeah, it's really fun. It's a fun mm -hmm. one. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I also, uh, I reread that not that long ago in the past couple of years. And I saw the film once in the past couple of years on a, a airplane. Um, just mm -hmm. other, one other thing about that though, I think last week they were sharing uh, some of the, you know, the screen tests of the, of the guys in, in the outsider so if you get a chance to look that up it was really cool yeah good one yeah there i think some of the x one of the dvd or blu-ray releases has like the extra footage of some of the actors being interviewed and it's a really they had a really intense like um audition process to, to yeah. see what hot hollywood up-and-coming actor would be cast and a lot of those guys went on to be like you know I mean, there's a lot of big I mean, names in there that weren't yeah. big names at the time. There we go. Well, right. what's neat too, I feel like with um, younger people that are still reading it, like for school, likely they haven't read, they haven't, they they don't know the movie. They haven't seen it. They don't have those characters like branded in their brain. Like when I read this, I'm picturing like Rob Lowe as Soda Pop Curtis, you know? So when they're describing him or in the book, um, Dallas has blonde hair and in the movie, it's Matt Dillon with dark hair. I'm like, wait a minute. Cause I'm picturing Matt Dillon cause he's so good at that character. Um, and Ponyboy has dark hair or he has dark 
white hair in the book. It's just interesting watching like the, the differences, but with younger folks reading it today, they wouldn't have had that experience with like knowing what it was. So they were watching it after the book, which is kind of a cool opportunity to fall in love with the book first, which I always think is like a, an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, Cause sometimes the movies like kind of spoil it or ruin it or aren't as good or don't hold up, blah, blah, blah. But with this one, I feel like it's, a, it's, it's an interesting pairing. And same thing with Lord of the Rings though, too. Those movies are, are just phenomenal, you know? And I like to, they hold up, like they are, they're good. They're the fun movies to watch. Um, yeah, lots of good stuff. I'm sure most folks out there read something when they were younger and there's probably some things you might not want to read again, you know, but as an adult, you kind of want to pick something like, I want to read this again. So any other final thoughts? I just want to thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Beth. We're so happy to have another book brought to the table today. All right, well, thank you, uh, viewers, for tuning in to this episode of Bibliophiles. We were happy to share some books with you. If you have books you read when you were younger that you have revisited recently or are thinking about revisiting now, um, drop a comment, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, take it easy, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>